Welcome to each of you attending our weekly Monta Vista Grove Homes Convocation, sponsored by our resident association. And we're indebted to Tyler this afternoon at the Community Church of San Marino's Digital Ministry for effectively connecting us. The scripture reading this morning, this afternoon, is from the Hebrew book of Proverbs. That's chapter 21, verses 2, 3, 7, and 15. Every way of a person is right in their own eyes, but the Lord weighs the heart. To do righteousness and justice is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. The violence of the wicked will sweep them away because they refuse to do what is just. When justice is done, it is a joy to the righteous, but dismay to the evildoers. Thanks be to God for this message. Let us unite in prayer. God of all creation, as we increasingly learn more of our own history through the gifted scholarship of historians, help us to recognize it is not only documentation of our past, but is just as much about our present. There is no discontinuity between then and now. To look at, our, to look at and know our history enables us to recognize and to comprehend our current story. We offer gratitude for those who share gifts of research and analyses, expanding awareness and understanding of those who have lived and died outside our scope and experience. We pray in your holy name. Amen. Amen. It's my pleasure to welcome you and introduce our convocation speaker, history professor Richard Bell, who teaches at the University of Maryland. Jim and I have a niece, Barnett Pavao Zuckerman, who's an historical and zooarchaeologist who chairs the Department of Anthropology at University of Maryland. I learned from Professor Bell that he and Barnett serve on the University of Maryland's 1856 project. This is part of the University Studying Slavery Consortium. This multi-institutional collaboration focuses on sharing best practices and guiding principles for initiating truth-telling projects, addressing human bondage and racism in institutional histories. When we hear Professor Bell's presentation on his scholarly research published in his book, Stolen, it's apparent the contribution he makes identifying the role slavery played in the systemic inequities that still confront Black Americans. Thank you for your excellent book, Rick, and for sharing your painstaking research and analysis with us today. And we'll turn it over to you now, Rick. <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, thank you, Tyler. Thank you to all of you listening to me right now. I can see some of you if you've got your cameras on. Uh, hello to you. Uh, at one point, we were supposed to be in uh, person, but then I think the weather and uh, some construction on your property got the better of us. So Zoom will have to be um, a useful second best. Um, let me tell you very briefly about myself. You're probably noticing an accent when I talk. Um, uh, I'm originally British. I was born in North London. Uh, all my family still lives in England. Uh, but I came to the US about 20, 25 years ago to get a PhD in American history, something that all my British friends and family thought was a very strange uh, decision. Uh, and I've been living here ever since. I'm married to an American woman from Missouri, of all places, on God's earth. And we have two terrifyingly American children, uh, two daughters, one aged nine, whose name is Ruby, one aged six, whose name is Rosie. Um, so I'm actually very close to you right now. Uh, I'm about a 30 minute walk away from many of you uh, because I've been working at the Huntington Library uh, for the last couple of days and I'll be here through next Friday, uh, and I'm doing research on a couple of new books, which I'd be happy to discuss during Q&A. Uh, so it's a happy coincidence that I'm in the same time zone 
as you. All right, with that, let me uh, go ahead and share my screen. Uh, we are going to talk about uh, how I spent the last 10 years of my life, which is at work on a project um, about kidnapping and slavery in pre-Civil War America, a project that culminated in a book called Stolen. Um, I'm going to talk about that research and analysis for about 30, 35 minutes. Uh, and then with Barbara and Tyler's help, I'm going to take as many comments and questions as we can. Um, you probably know better than I do about how you like to communicate in these convocations, but you can certainly um, uh, put comments and questions in the chat. Um, you can raise your virtual hand, your little yellow hand under the reactions tab, if you know what that is, or you can just wave frantically until Barbara calls on you. That also works as well. But just to be clear, we'll hold all that stuff until the end, after about 30 minutes of me talking at you about what is pretty serious and, of course, sobering uh, stuff. So let's get started. I want to begin by telling you that Cornelius Sinclair was 10 years old and he was trapped. Cornelius was stuck, locked in the belly of a small ship that looked a bit like this, that was bobbing in the middle of the Delaware River, a mile south of Philadelphia. A man had grabbed this 10-year-old kid from a spot near Philadelphia's market an hour ago, shoved a gag into his mouth, tossed him into a wagon, and hauled him here. And it was dark below the ship's waterline, but Cornelius could see enough to know that he was not the only child locked down here. Four pairs of eyes stared back at him. Four other African-American boys. One looked about his size, he was probably 10 or 11, like Cornelius. Two more were taller, perhaps 14 or 15. The last of them was shorter and smaller than everyone else. He might have been as young as eight. And yesterday, all five boys had been free, like you and me. But today they were enslaved, prisoners of a gang of child snatchers, who planned to sell their lives and labor, most likely to plantation owners in the deep south. If their abductors got away with this, 10-year-old Cornelius would spend the rest of his life as someone else's property somewhere very far away. He would probably never see his family again. Cornelius disappeared in late August, 1825 one of dozens of African-American children to vanish in very similar circumstances from Philadelphia that single year alone. In the early 1800s, Philadelphia was the hub of American slavery's blackest market. Its gridded streets and tangled alleys were hunting grounds for crews of professional kidnappers, who made their livings turning free black kids like Cornelius into Southern slaves. They did their work swiftly and shamelessly. In brazen affront to Philadelphia's reputation at the time, not only as the city of brotherly love, but also as a safe haven for people of color and as the headquarters of the American anti-slavery movement. But to criminals, to kidnappers, of course, none of that mattered. In truth, early 19th century Philadelphia was probably one of the most dangerous places to be free and black anywhere in the United States. And this was a product of its location. Philadelphia was the nearest major free city on the East Coast to the slave South. Philadelphia lay just 40 miles north of the Mason-Dixon line the boundary that separated Pennsylvania from several slave states to its south, including Maryland, where I live. As Pennsylvania and other northern states had slowly disentangled themselves from race slavery in the 50 years after the American Revolution, that boundary along Pennsylvania's southern border had become ever more important, especially for black folk. By 1825, the year that Cornelius was kidnapped, the Mason-Dixon line seemed to divide two worlds, separating northern free states from the southern slave states. 
Philadelphia's proximity to this frontier line made its many free black residents attractive targets for professional people snatchers pushing in from nearby slave states. They preyed on the members of the city's free black community relentlessly, putting bullseyes on their backs and prices on their heads. The people they stole away from freedom could fetch anywhere up to $15,000 per person in today's money in Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama. Three of the new territories and states that were rising up along the Gulf Coast at exactly this time. The American settlers swarming into that region demanded a nearly bottomless supply of forced labor to cut sugarcane and pick cotton, and they would take almost anyone to do that unpaid work. Buying a small percentage of their forced laborers from kidnappers of free black people was not likely their first choice, but their options were limited. Planters down there in the deep south have been forced to look to American sources for their manpower needs ever since 1808, the year that lawmakers in Washington had passed legislation outlawing any further imports of black people from Africa and the Caribbean for the purposes of enslaving them in the United States. This 1808 decision was a major turning point in the history of slavery in America because it closed off the Atlantic slave trade, but spurred the growth of an American internal domestic slave trade within the United States. After that 1808 decision, interstate slave traders here in the US tried to satisfy the Southwestern settlers' demands for black labor by bringing them thousands of American-born enslaved people each year from existing slave states like Maryland and Virginia that were in surplus. And that was legal and it was big business. But settlers down in the deep South wanted even more. And the stronger their demand, the more tempting, the more profitable it became for anyone sufficiently cold blooded to try to kidnap free children like Cornelius from Northern cities like Philadelphia, launder them into this legal supply chain I've just described and sell them in this vast new Southwestern slave market. These economic incentives left Philadelphia's large and dynamic free black community dangerously exposed. By 1825, the city of brotherly love become the center of a nationwide kidnapping operation. It had become the largest northern depot of something I call America's reverse underground railroad. So when I use that phrase today, America's reverse underground railroad, I'm describing what I just described, the kidnapping and trafficking into slavery of free black Americans, usually from northern towns and cities. And this reverse underground railroad, and its much better known namesake, the Underground Railroad, ran in opposite directions and for very different purposes, of course. But because they're opposites, they were also sort of mirror images of each other. On the Underground Railroad, the good one, the famous one, the Harriet Tubman one, enslaved people abandoned southern plantations and trekked usually northward, dreaming of new lives and new opportunities in freedom. On America's reverse Underground Railroad, free black people were stolen from northern cities like Philadelphia and were made to trudge usually southward to be sold into plantation slavery. On the Underground Railroad, conductors like Harriet Tubman risked their lives and liberty to help black fugitives make these epic journeys of freedom. While on America's reverse underground railroad, the conductors were kidnappers and human traffickers motivated only by money. These two networks, one heroic and courageous, the other obviously evil and monstrous, roared to life at the same time. 
in the early 1800s to exploit what by then had become major differences in the legal status of slavery in the North and the South. Both networks were loosely organized and opportunistic. Both ran on secrecy and relied on small circles of trusted participants, forged documents, false identities and disguise. The direction of travel was usually very different, but the routes taken by freedom seekers going north and victims of kidnapping made to go south, the routes were largely the same and they might even have passed one another on certain roads from time to time. And what's more, the volume of traffic on these two metaphorical railroads was also roughly the same size. Each year, each one carried hundreds of black adults and children across state lines, half towards freedom, half towards slavery. I think most Americans know quite a lot about the Underground Railroad. Historians have spent decades studying the strategies and tactics that Harriet Tubman and her fellow conductors and station agents used to help freedom seekers escape from slavery. Their achievements now command our attention. And there are Underground Railroad walking tours and television shows and museums. There's even a movie, Harriet, all of it dedicated to celebrating the men and women who created the secret network through which the enslaved could escape to freedom. But I think we know far less about America's reverse underground railroad. Its conductors and station agents worked tirelessly to remain untouchable. And the identities of all but a handful of these criminals still remain a secret, even today. They certainly never gave public lectures about their work or went on fundraising tours. Only rarely do their names and crimes even appear in police files or trial transcripts. Their low profile and surviving legal sources, the result of the years they spent in the shadows, protected by bribes, corruption, and by too much indifference and apathy among ordinary Americans who knew exactly what they were doing and did nothing to stop it. The outlaws who built America's reverse underground railroad left no business records or bundles of private letters for historians to read and examine at places like the Huntingdon. They didn't write memoirs. They didn't pose for paintings or photographs leaving journalists and activists to guess, as you see here in this image, as to what they might have looked like. This is not something anyone posed for. But despite all that whitewashing, obfuscation, silencing, invisibility, despite all that, as I argue in my new book, Stolen, these professional kidnappers nonetheless left their mark everywhere on 19th century America. If we think not just about Philadelphia, where the true story I tell in Stolen begins, but about every Northern town or city on the East Coast with a free black population, if we think not just about 1825, when this true story begins, but about each and every year between 1808 and the Civil War, we can say with depressing certainty that all told, kidnappers who built America's reverse underground railroad stole away likely tens of thousands of free black people. Many of them children like Cornelius who were under the age of 16. And let me be very clear here, most of those they kidnapped from liberty were never heard from again. Their families and friends searched frantically they lobbied, petitioned, advertised. They waited in earnest for news, but usually nothing and no one came back. Free black people in Northern cities like Philly had few white allies in this period of American history. Beyond the meager ranks of a handful of Quaker-led anti-slavery societies. 
What's more, white employers openly discriminated against African-American job applicants, while city constables generally ignored people of color's complaints and turned a blind eye to most white on black street violence. So when kids like Cornelius went missing, their parents could hardly ever persuade mayors, magistrates, and policemen to get involved, to do something. It was rarer still for anyone to be able to gather enough evidence to issue arrest warrants, search property, and interrogate suspects. And even then, experienced members of these many different kidnapping crews knew exactly what to do, exactly what to say to get um, the, to talk their way out of trouble and to get back to work. It looks like we have almost 40 households logged in right now, which is lovely. I'm guessing all of you have heard of 12 Years a Slave. As you'll remember, 12 Years a Slave was the name of a movie based on a memoir written by a guy named Solomon Northup who was one of the tens of thousands of victims of America's reverse Underground Railroad. Unlike almost everyone else, however, Northup later escaped Southern slavery. It took him 12 years to do it, but he did it. He returned home, and then he wrote about it all. And in that memoir, 12 Years a Slave, which he wrote in 1853, Northup explains what riding America's reverse underground railroad was like for him. He explains how a pair of well-dressed white con men lured him into New York City from his home upstate in 1841. At the time, Northup was a well-educated and prosperous musician in his mid-30s. In Manhattan, they wined and dined him, and if you remember the movie, they drugged him too. And then they sold him to an interstate slave trader in Washington, D.C. Northup was soon forced onto a slave ship bound for New Orleans, and there he was sold in one of that city's infamous slave showrooms to a planter who then put him to work in his cane fields. In 2013, that Oscar-winning film, based on Northup's extraordinary autobiography, drew overdue attention to his ordeal. But both the memoir and the movie offer misleading views of the people whom the Underground Railroad usually targeted and how these kidnappers usually made their money. Because it turns out that Northup's experience on America's reverse Underground Railroad was not at all typical of everyone else's. Its kidnappers rarely approached highly literate, middle-aged men like Northup. No, kidnappers preferred instead to lure away poorly educated street kids with tricks that could swiftly separate them from their families. Very few of their captives traveled by ship to New Orleans either. Instead, kidnappers forced most boys and girls to trek southward on foot in small specialized overland convoys known as coffles. Their prisoners rarely ended up in showrooms or on the auction block and were vastly more likely to be sold off in ones and twos along the way in all cash furtive deals to hard up planters in the interior of Mississippi or Alabama to men who wanted to buy more human beings but who were too cheap to pay big city New Orleans slave prices. All of that was what was typical. And all of that is almost exactly what happened to Cornelius Sinclair, one of the five central figures in my book. In August of 1825, Cornelius and Sam and Enos and Alex and Joe fell into the hands of 19th century America's most fearsome gang of kidnappers. Their captors hustled them onto a ship just outside Philadelphia, which you can see in the top right of this map. Their captors warehoused them for a while, 
in a pair of safe houses down on the Delaware, Maryland line, just above the word Nanticote at the bottom of your screen. And then after two weeks in that safe house, they marched them onward. Halfway across this vast continent, toward the deep south, where they tried to sell all five free children as slaves. This was a soul-destroying journey. If you're a child, it's a journey of two million steps. I have a lot to say about it in the book, as you can imagine, though in the interests of time this afternoon, I'm going to pass over much of this journey. And likewise, my publisher insists that in talks like this, I pass over much of the book's extraordinary second half, in which readers learn that some, though not all, of these five boys make a miraculous escape from all this and begin the astonishing odyssey home to Philadelphia referred to in the subtitle. All I will say here is that what Cornelius and Sam and Enos and Alex and Joe made happen next in the second half of the story was indeed astonishing to them and to me. It would involve two murders, three exhumations of dead bodies from the earth, an escape, a recapture, a suicide, a race riot, a lawsuit, the nation's first most wanted list, and America's largest manhunt so far. Instead of breaking my obligations to my publisher and telling you everything that happens in the book, um, let me just quickly note that the full story of what did happen next is a story that's never before been told, and for understandable reasons. Cornelius was a child at the time. He came from a hard-up family that was not the sort to leave behind many traces in libraries and archives like the Huntington. And this is a problem, of course, because this is the true story. It's history. And historians need sources, lots of sources, to reconstruct past lives in ways that are fair and true. The stories and struggles of the many Americans who did not leave behind rich troves of papers, diaries, or memoirs often remain untold and unstudied as a result. To reconstruct Cornelius's journey along America's reverse Underground Railroad, I began by wringing whatever I could from a small packet of letters written to or from this guy, the mayor of Philadelphia, Joseph Watson, a man who belatedly wades into this story almost at the last minute, and from coverage of Cornelius's kidnapping in a single anti-slavery magazine. Now, to be clear, historians have known about these modest sources, the letters and the magazine for some time, but on their own, they turn out to be too few, too thin, to sustain a whole book length reconstruction of this astonishing odyssey into and out of American slavery. So I have had to keep going. I've had to go looking elsewhere, digging around in any archive I could find for scraps of information that when put together could help flesh this all out. And along the way, there have been lots of days spent finding nothing useful at all. Looking for needles in haystacks, but finding only lots of hay. If you've done your own genealogical or historical research, I'm sure you recognize that feeling. But ultimately, you should keep at it, because for me, it was certainly worth it. Over six years of research before I started writing this, I unearthed dozens and dozens of needles buried in those haystacks. New sources about this case, buried within 35 archives in 14 states and DC. Among those new sources I found, I found the handwritten notes of a trial that took place in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, a trial which decided the fate of one of these boys, the fate of Cornelius, actually. I also discovered a pair of letters 
in which one of the kidnappers names his accomplices and describes their roles in this particular case, a genuinely astonishing find that I even copied into the back of the book so you can read it for yourself. But most affectingly of all, at least for me, was this. A missing persons ad placed in a Philly newspaper by Cornelius's grieving father. It's short, so I can read it to you. It says, boy lost, the subscriber's son, Cornelius Sinclair, a colored boy about 11 years old, left his friends yesterday. And as he had no cause and had never before absented himself, it's feared he's been seduced away by some evil-minded person. My son is a very dark-skinned, mixed-race lad. He's pretty stout-built. He's got thin, long fingers. His eyes are weak. His left eye is smaller than his right. Any person hearing of our son will confer a favor on his afflicted parents by giving information to my employer at this address, Joseph Sinclair. As you can imagine, I read this ad hundreds of times in my life since I found it in 2013. Every time I read it, the same two words jump out at me like they're 60 foot high, like they're written in neon. Afflicted parents. All of us are children of parents. Many of us are parents of children or grandchildren. The thought that my children could be taken from me, stolen from me, and there'd be nothing I could do to get them back, that just rips at me. Tears at me in a really basic human way. Afflicted parents. That seems to me like the understatement of the 19th century. So before we turn to your questions, let me wrap up with a couple of brief reflections about why I think learning about America's reverse Underground Railroad is important and why Cornelius Sinclair's particular experience as a rider on that railroad is worth your time. To begin with, I would argue forcefully that black lives have always mattered. And so any true story about free American children ripped from their American families and swallowed up by American slavery is worth reconstructing for its own damning sake. But the remarkable ordeal that Cornelius and his four fellow captives endured also demands our attention today for many other reasons. For one thing, it serves as a pointed reminder that in the decades before the Civil War, child snatching was heartbreakingly frequent in northern towns and cities, and that Black freedom was achingly fragile. It demonstrates, too, the important role that this grotesque trade in kidnapped free people played in accelerating the spread of American slavery into the Deep South over the same period. Now, as I said, I'm not allowed to spill all the beans about the book's astonishing second half or tell you exactly what happened to Cornelius after he was kidnapped and trafficked into Alabama. But in case you choose not to read the book, I will drop a few big hints here. And I will say that the dogged efforts of all those involved in trying to save him and the four other boys from the horrors of slavery in the Southwest would have profound consequences. The rescue efforts of parents and allies and the aftermath of their campaign would radicalize black communities across the free states, inspiring African-Americans to embrace bold new tactics in the cause of their own self-defense and mutual protection. Their efforts would reshape the rest of the American anti-slavery movement as well. Their efforts would encourage white abolitionists like the two white women who wrote this children's anti-slavery alphabet to focus the Northern reading public's attention on the suffering of black families forcibly separated by kidnappers, slave catchers, slave traders, and by slavery itself. But most immediately, 
Outrage over the abduction of these five boys would force lawmakers in Pennsylvania to pass a tough new anti-kidnapping measure known as a personal liberty law. This 1826 Pennsylvania personal liberty law would enrage Southerners and slaveholders more so than any other state law passed before the Civil War and set in motion a chain of court challenges to it and political retaliations against it that culminated in the passage through Congress of the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 a pro-slavery, pro-kidnapping abomination put this country on a collision course with civil war. To conclude then, Cornelius Sinclair's experience as a rider on America's reverse underground railroad was the result of the meeting of massive economic and political forces. And what happened to him? And the things that he and the other boys made happen next would, as I've just suggested, usher in a new chapter in the history of slavery and freedom in the United States. But that lasting legacy must not be allowed to obscure the urgent stakes of his particular story. A 10-year-old boy and four other free children were dragged into slavery they would have to fight like hell to try to escape. Thanks very much for listening. I am looking forward to your comments and questions. Um, this book came out a couple of years ago, right during the pandemic. So with any luck, your local library uh, has it. Uh, if you'd like to get a copy, please buy it from an independent bookstore. Um, if you'd like to get a signed copy, I'd be delighted to sell you one, of course. All you have to do is send me an email my email address is up on the screen, uh, rjbell at umd.edu. Uh, at this point, I'm going to turn things back to uh, Barbara to MC any questions and comments. Reminder, folks, you can use the chat to scribble down any comments and questions, or you can raise your virtual hand, your little yellow hand, to attract our attention, or you can just unmute and start talking. Whatever works for you probably works for us. I'm looking forward to hearing your comments and questions and doing my best to respond to them. Barbara, back to you. Barbara is muted right now. There we so, go. I wanna thank you, Rick, for, for your extraordinary research and, and diligent analysis. Um, it is really astonishing how much you did manage to pull together in six years, but it's a, it's a heart-wrenching story and a very important one. And I think both for, for understanding the historical context, but again, as, as Rick has mentioned, uh, for today to understand where we are today. And um, uh, please, please ask your questions because I know there will be an interesting dialogue here. Rick, this is uh, uh, Terry McGonigal. Um, your comments at the end were uh, auspicious. They, they cast a dark shadow that the law that was passed in Philadelphia in 1826 led to a quarter century of opposition that led to the passage of the Fugitive Slave Law, which in some regards was a major contributor to the Civil War that transpired, you know, uh, a decade later. C can you just trace a little bit of that uh, path from 1826 to 1850 um, and, yeah. and, and, the, and the kind of opposition that arose to undo the purpose of that law? Yeah, I certainly can, Terry. I'm going to begin by taking my slides down. Folks, I'm going to put my email address into the chat before I answer Terry's question, but now I should be able to better see most of you, which is always an advantage, and you can better see me as well. So if you don't want to be in touch privately, my email address just went into the chat. Um, so Terry's uh, onto something, right? There is a, what, a 35-year 
uh, interval between this story from 1825, 1826, and the outbreak of the Civil War in 1860, 1861. As you all know from high school, a lot of things happen uh, in that uh, period. Uh, most of them concentrated in the 1850s, so much so that for a long time, we've done a bad job of looking at what happened before 1850, as if the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 just appears from nowhere. And of course, there's a real historical context and backstory to that act. The missing link here, Terry, is a Supreme Court case from 1842 called Prigg versus Pennsylvania. Um, this is a case which is designed, it's a test case designed to challenge the anti-kidnapping law that Pennsylvania put into place after this kidnapping case. Uh, and the Supreme Court does indeed strike down um, anti-kidnapping state laws like the one in Pennsylvania in that 1842 um, Supreme Court case known as Prigg versus Pennsylvania, which had everything to do with another kidnapping of a woman named Margaret Morgan. Um, so after 1842, the Supreme Court seems to be saying that it's open season for kidnappers. They can do whatever they want and that slave traders and bounty hunters, all of them can have open season. Some northern states um, defy that Supreme Court ruling of 1842 and continue to maintain their anti-kidnapping personal liberty laws. That draws the fury of Southern um, congressmen in Washington who decide to write new legislation that will make it crystal clear once and for all that state level laws do not trump federal laws when it comes to black people's liberty, that the federal government gets to say who is free and who is not. And that law is, of course, the federal 1850 Fugitive uh, Slave Act. Um, many historians would tell you, and I would agree with them, that that is the firing pistol, uh, the starter pistol uh, for the Civil War, which will blow up 10 years later. After the um, Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, we see a flurry of things that seem to ratchet up the stakes between the North and the South on the slavery question. You can think of, for instance, the publication of Uncle Tom's Cabin in 1853. You can think of um, the Kansas-Nebraska Act of, I think, 1856. You can think of the Dred Scott decision of 1857, in which the Supreme Court said Black people have no rights which the white man should respect. Uh, you can think of John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry in 1859. You can think of the election of Abraham Lincoln in 1860. And then, of course, the secession of South Carolina, uh, the first of 11 states to secede. I could go deeper on any of this, uh, of course. But the point is, the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 doesn't just emerge from nowhere. It is yeah. uh, its own position uh, on, a, on a timeline that takes us from 1826 through 1842 and then up to 1850. Great question, Terry. Thank you for that. And Barbara, I'm seeing some questions pop up in the chat. Should I take a couple of them and then maybe move over to Norm after that? Yes, yes, please. Thank you. So I'll take Hugh's question first and then I'll come to Norman and then I'll come to Betty if that's all right. Um, so Hugh says, <laughs> what prompted you with your British background to become interested in this aspect of American history? Oh, dear Lord, this is a biographical question. I don't know. I don't like talking about myself, but here we go. Um, so uh, I went to college to study European history. Uh, I thought studying uh, um, sex and violence and European peasants was pretty interesting. And it carried me a long way through college in the UK. I went to the University of Cambridge as an undergraduate. But by the time I reached senior year, um, I had run out of courses on medieval European peasants to take, and I needed three more credits to graduate. So I looked around for any course that didn't meet too early in the day. I was looking for something that met around 11 a.m. Because I was, you know, like 21 years old. This is how we choose courses. Um, mm -hmm. and I ended up in a course on colonial America. Um, and to my great surprise, the professor convinced me rapidly and definitively that American history was actually extremely interesting uh, and that there was lots to discuss. And the early America in particular 
uh, was incredibly complicated and important. Um, it also helped this professor, whose name was Betty Wood, was one of the most dynamic and gifted teachers I've ever met in my professional life. If she'd been talking about ancient Egypt, I would have been a convert to that as well, I'm sure. Um, so she got me interested and hooked in an early American history. I decided to go get a PhD in that, um, in American history. So, of course, it made sense to go to America to get it. So um, I abandoned my British family and went to get a PhD in America. I went to Harvard University for seven years. I fully expected I would get a degree, go right back to London and find a job there teaching American history to British people. But of course, it turns out that outside America, no one really cares about American people, especially <laughs> British people. Especially British people. Uh, so there weren't really any jobs for someone like me uh, over there, which dawned on me slowly in the course of getting my PhD. And just as importantly, uh, while I was in grad school in Massachusetts, uh, I met a woman from Missouri. Uh, we're now married. Uh, and so I have another reason to stay in this great country. Um, <laughs> And I was lucky to get a job at Maryland, University of Maryland, where I teach now out of graduate school. As some of you may know, the academic job market is very, very hard. Any job is a good job. And I was lucky to get a really great uh, job. And I've been there, I'm, I'm tenured now. I've been there for about 20 years. I really like it. Um, and I'm drawn to this subject in particular because the longer I study American history, and I've been at it 20, 25 years now, the more convinced I am that the freedom struggle, the story that takes us from slavery to freedom, uh, the story of African-Americans journey through this country is the central story of American history. And to tell American history without placing the freedom struggle at the center is I think to put your head in the sand to some degree or other, the struggle for racial justice of all people, but especially African descended people, is the fundamental story in this country. So while my first book was about something else, um, it was that central story um, that was becoming harder and harder to push to one side. And I didn't want to push it to one side, I wanted to embrace it and enfold it. And so when this, the events of this kidnapping came to my attention, I figured this was my attempt to make a contribution to that essential um history thanks for that question uh norman you've been very patient where are you um can you unmute and ask your question right here yes uh having done extensive genealogical research i am just applaud you for your the <laughs> persistence and determination on it and to give us a little insight into that research tell us about a time that you seemed to hit a dead end that just you couldn't get past it and how you overcame it Oh, wow. So I wish every story had a happy ending, right? You know, like, how did you overcome your adversity? Well, not all adversity is overcome, unfortunately. With historical research, there's not always a happy resolution to every everything. Right. But uh, let me let me try. So um, the last chapter of this book um, has 11 short chapters, um, tries to tell you what happened after this kidnapping episode um, ended. And one of the questions I wanted to know was what happened to all the characters in my story? Uh, what happened to them after 1826? And this was especially true for the um, survivors of the kidnapping itself. You know, some of these boys survived this ordeal and lived their lives as free adults afterwards, which is a miraculous outcome, by the way. It did not normally happen like this. And so I wanted to know, well, what were they like as adults? What did they do as adults? How did they use their gift, their second chance, their free life? Um, for me, that was a fundamental question. Um, answering that question was one of the hardest things I've ever done uh, for exactly the genealogical reasons you're suggesting, uh, Norm. Um, not everything uh, can be answered by a quick search of ancestry.com. However wonderful a tool like that is, they're only as good as the sources on which it's based, right? And most sources have not yet been digitized. Most historical sources remain undigitized. We think only 5% of historical sources have so far been digitized. Um, African-American um, individuals do not leave behind them nearly as many historical sources in the first place, and the chances that their sources will be preserved in archives and paid for by donors 
is quite small compared to rich white folks like, you know, George Washington or Abraham Lincoln or someone like that. So when you're dealing with poor African-American children and their families, the chances of being able to track them across time are pretty small to start with. If you add into the fact that only one of these five boys could read or write uh, at the time they were kidnapped, that compounds the detective's problems. If you add to the fact um, that there's a civil war uh, which throws, you know, all historical archiving up into the air, in which there are fires in every major city that destroy important historical collections, and that everyone's on the move and gets scattered to the four winds, then you can see how figuring out what happened to these boys as adults is actually much harder than it sounds. So I put my best effort in, and I was able to find out a decent amount about each of the survivors of this story but not enough to satisfy me. I wanted to know more and I was frustrated by the things I still didn't know. So I threw money at the problem, Norm. I got a grant and I dished it out to three other historians who I hoped could do better than me. One was an expert in African-American genealogy. Uh, one was an expert in Philadelphia social history sources, you know, tax lists, church records, uh, census data, things like that. And another lived in Salt Lake City and knew how to get access to the family history center of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which has, has done so much to digitize sources for all Americans. I told them what I'd found. I said, can you do better? Uh, I gave them each a thousand bucks in two weeks, and they all came back finding new things that I had not found. And I paid them for their research. Their research became my research, and I added it to my collective understanding. And you have in the book, in the last chapter, the collected wisdom of four historians working as hard as possible. And still, there are big holes as to what we do not know about these African-American um, lives. A reminder, of course, that you know any library, any archive is also the product of, you know, racial politics and white supremacy, that th some things don't get recorded and some things don't get saved. So that was a major challenge throughout this project. Thanks for the great question, Norm. I'm gonna go to the chat, to Betty, then I'm gonna go to um, the person who's waving their hand at me. It says 5100, but let me go to Betty Glick first of all in the chat. Uh, Betty says, do you have any sense of the overall numbers of children who were stolen? Do you know if genealogical DNA is helping people make connections to their families? Um, I've not heard any um, updates on, gene uh, on um, genetic um, historical investigations for um, a while. Um, I know that companies like 23andMe have, of course, been aggregating a lot of data in recent years, um, but how individualized that data is in terms of what's available for historical researches, um, I don't think is yet uh, known. Uh, DNA has been useful in um, select cases, famously in proving the paternity of Sally Hemings's children. Um, as, uh, as Thomas Jefferson as the biological father. But there are many questions that genetic evidence is not available for. I'm not aware, for instance, of any living descendants of the survivors of this story. I am aware of living descendants of some of the kidnappers. I am aware of living descendants of some of the allies that these boys turn to, but I've yet to discover a living descendant of one of the boys themselves. I figure if I keep talking about this book to as many audiences as possible, one day I will meet someone who recognizes this from their own family tradition, but that's not yet happened. To come to your first question, Betty, uh, um, do you have any sense of the overall numbers of children who were stolen? Yes, yeah, so in the talk, I, I, I said likely tens of thousands of free black Americans were kidnapped into slavery between the revolution and the civil war. So notice that phrasing, likely tens of thousands. Two things to notice. First of all, likely is a hedge, right? Likely is like maybe, probably. And secondly, tens of thousands. Does that mean 20,000? Or does that mean 99,000? That's a big gap, right? So all I want you to understand is that I can document a great number of cases and I can assert a magnitude <clears throat> scale but I cannot offer an exact estimate. Remember, I'm dealing with criminal behavior 
How many people smoke marijuana in this country uh, today? Uh, how many people uh, jaywalked in this country last year? We will never know those things, right? Criminal activity is not accurately uh, recorded, regardless of how serious or frivolous the crime um, is. So all we can deal with is estimates. Um, but I'm very comfortable, sadly, with the notion that it's measured in the tens of thousands of free African American people. And while other scholars who have briefly looked at this phenomenon before um, have often focused on Solomon Northup and extrapolated from his case, I can say with a great deal more certainty that children are overrepresented, um, that a great majority of the people kidnapped are children under the age of 16. And I'm the first scholar to be able to document that. Uh, thanks for that question, Betty. Now, who was waving at me? Uh, there you are. Go ahead. Tell me, tell me your name. Catherine. Catherine. Catherine Hughes, Richard. Hi, Catherine. Catherine Bell Hughes. Da, da, da. Are we related somehow? <laughs> <laughs> Richard, um, I'm almost speechless. I, I'm an 86-year-old African-American woman who lives here at the Grove, who grew up in the South. And first, I want to say... Um, I'm so touched uh, by your research, by your book, but more about, about how you have <clears throat> presented this this afternoon. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, I'm almost speechless. And I'm speechless because at my age, I have never heard this story. Uh, before it was mentioned to me by Barbara. And so I'm so pleased <clears throat> that you have brought it to, to my attention. And I now will accept the responsibility, re responsibility of making sure that my African-American brothers and sisters, particularly those who are Presbyterian, the National Black Presbyterian Caucus, that they know about the story, know about your book. I'm going to purchase one tonight uh, on email, but I'm going to get the word out. Uh, everybody needs to know this, particularly African-Americans. We hear a lot of stories. We see a lot of movies. In fact, I've said I am never going to see another slave movie <laughs> uh, because they have not had meaning, but you have given new meaning to me to uh, to slave movies. And I certainly want to read the book and um, I want others to read it. Thank you so much. Catherine, thanks for that lovely uh, comment. I really appreciate it. I really take your point about what you said about the way um, you know mass media often depicts the African-American experience as a parade of fetishized pain and suffering. And I think, you know, uh, too often uh, that tips over into exploitation of uh, black bodies in pain, into basically the pornography um, of, of pain, which I think is very um, dehumanizing, uh, actually. So uh, that was one of the things that I tried to keep in mind as I was writing this book, in which there is, of course, suffering, lots and lots of suffering, but trying to remember um, that we're dealing with um, with human lives here, with mothers and fathers and uh, uh, and children, and how would, how would I and my my family want to be represented if we were being depicted in stories like this? So I tried to keep that in mind. I would just say that you know your reaction I, that when you said you know I'd never heard this before was my reaction too uh, when I stumbled stumbled uh, onto this uh, story more than ten years ago. I came to it, Catherine, because my previous book was about something equally sober. Uh, I'd written a book about suicide in American history between the Revolution and the Civil War. And as I was finishing it up, uh, a friend of mine sent me a newspaper clipping from 1829, um, four years after the events in this book, uh, which told the story of the alleged suicide of a white woman in her 60s named Patty Cannon, who was on trial for murder in a rural town in Delaware in 1829. Um, as I began digging into the circumstances of her death to see if she'd committed suicide or not, I don't think she did, um, I became aware of who she was when she was alive. 
And she was the co-leader of one of the most notorious and most fearsome and most prolific gangs of kidnappers of African-Americans anywhere in the United States. Her name was Patty Cannon, a name I'd never heard before. Um, and her gang was responsible for dozens of kidnappings, including the one I document in this book, um, Stolen. So as I began digging into her life, I became aware of just how many gangs like this were operating and how many kidnappings of free Black people from within the U.S. were happening in this period. And by then, Catherine, I'd been a professional historian for 15 years, and I'd never heard this. I'd heard of Solomon Northup, but I assumed that was one guy. Just bad luck, one guy. It's not, right? It was an epidemic of kidnapping. So I figured if I didn't know this stuff, and I'm paid to know this stuff, and I, if I didn't know this stuff, then maybe other people didn't know it either. So I wrote this book, which uses one kidnapping to illuminate the larger phenomenon, um, you know, to educate myself, and then to share those findings with as many people as possible. So thanks for being receptive to that. To bless that. you. God yeah. bless you. Thank uh, you. And then, you're quite welcome. And then back in the chat uh, here, uh, Nancy says, how has your stolen book been received? What kind of feedback have you been uh, given? Um, so my book was published right at the start of the pandemic, uh, Nancy. So the first thing I should say is that uh, I was touring around the country with this book and then COVID said no. It's COVID said go back home. So COVID didn't like this book one bit as far as I can tell. Um, but ever since, you know, Zoom came into my life, it's been possible actually to reach, you know, communities of readers in many more places. You know, I'm from Maryland and I'm speaking to people in, in you know, Los Angeles, Pasadena, San Marino right now, which is exciting. Um, I can say that the feedback to my face has been very good uh, indeed. People have really responded to this book in the way that Catherine suggested she had uh, just a moment uh, ago. Um, I've given uh, talks like this to a lot of uh, faith groups, uh, to a lot of uh, African-American community and genealogical and historical uh, groups, and to a lot of groups focused on racial justice and DEI work um, as well. You know, surprise, surprise, there are limits to what I can do. I've not ever given this talk in Mississippi or Louisiana or Alabama because I've never once been invited. Um, I accept every invitation to talk about this book, uh, and yet there are real limits to who wants to hear it, um, unfortunately. So uh, that's about all I can say, but it's been a wild uh, journey, and um, um, there, there's, a, there's a screenwriter somewhere in Hollywood uh, working on an adaptation of this uh, into a TV series. We'll see if that happens. Most TV series don't ever see the light of day, um, but this is a story that I think is important, and I think if handled sensitively, um, could be a powerful um, thing for a mass audience, um, but uh, I've just been fortunate enough to have these boys in my life for the last uh, 10 years, and I try to honor them um, every time I talk about this. Thanks. For Question. That. Yeah, Question. That? I want to uh, know about um, future projects. What do you have on your table that you're <laughs> working on or thinking about working on? Yeah, great question, Dean. Thanks for that. So, you know, as you, as you know, I'm at the Huntingdon uh, this week and next week doing research um, for two very different book projects. Um, the first one I'll mention uh, is also an African-American history project. It's about uh, civil rights in the 1850s. And it's about a woman who was basically Rosa Parks 100 years before Rosa Parks in New York City. This is a free black woman named Elizabeth Jennings who would not wait for the blacks only streetcar, who got on the whites only streetcar and wouldn't get off. She was thrown off by the conductor and injured. She sued the conductor and the streetcar company and she won, um, forcing that company to desegregate its streetcars in New York, forcing other companies to do the same and catalyzing a movement that spread from one northern city to another to desegregate mass transit in the 1850s and 1860s, leaving only the South still segregated when it came to mass transit. So I'm trying to tell her story right now, which is a lot harder than I'm making it sound because she didn't leave a scrap of writing despite being the daughter of a minister. I find that very frustrating, <laughs> um, but I'm working on it. Uh, and then the other book is wildly different to that one, Dean. The other book is 
a global history of the American Revolution, by which I mean um, a history of the global reach and global dimensions of the American Revolution. So the role of the French alliance, the Spanish alliance, the role of German Hessian mercenaries in the British army, the role of Native Americans, enslaved Africans, the role of the founding of Australia and Irish Americans uh, in the revolution, all these different people who normally get written out so we can give all the credit just to George Washington, I think they deserve to be alongside him and the patriots and the founding fathers in better understanding why this founding conflict mattered and the ripple effects it caused around the world. So um, right now I'm working on the Spanish role in the American Revolution, so I'm reading a lot of books about Spain, despite me not speaking a word of Spanish, so yeah. I'm relying on translations a lot, yeah. Oh, Rick, thank you so much. This We're deeply indebted to you for your uh, spirited presentation and uh, for the opportunity to hear about the, your experience of pulling this book together and what you're doing currently. And uh, I want to thank you for being here today. Uh, it was just an outstanding presentation. Thanks very and, much. And let me just invite everybody to tune in next week. Mark Chase of All Saints Episcopal Church, uh, the associate rector there, will be speaking to us about Martin Luther King. So again, thank you so much for attending today. And thank you, Richard. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. From the bottom of our hearts. Most welcome. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Totally out. I've been asleep this whole time. Oh, oh. Thank okay. You.